back to the Platonic values. I call them the Noah's Ark of universal ethics. Any one of you who have ever studied or took a crash course of Western European philosophy must have come across the importance of Plato as a single figure. Obviously, he doesn't appear just out of the blue. No one does. He stands on the shoulders of giants and therefore a giant himself. Plato was one time disciple of Socrates. And it is in Plato that the greatest ideas, along with ideals, that were generated prior to that time in the entire cradle of Western civilization Greece is known for, that have been so powerful that they were projected to our day and age, almost intact in terms of their aspiration. And we can even conclude that all this, what the ethics of Judeo-Christian tradition spoke of, were nothing other than recycling this, what was already ingrained in the ideas of Plato and disseminated throughout the ancient world under the term Neoplatonism. So what about Plato? Why are we talking about Platonic values? Why do I want to bring your attention there? So Plato argued that all these highly cherished ideas that we have today, that what would comprise to be the ideal human being in terms of fully developed psychologically individual. That all these, what we call virtues, are inherently true to every single human being. Why? Because there's nothing personal about them. In other words, Plato's objective here Plato's objective values are not dependent on a system of belief or even mode of perception because these values lay outside of an individual. Do you understand why? It's very important. These values that we call ethical values, all these Ten Commandments of that Moses came up with, right, or came down rather, with, already ingrained, according to Plato, in the very psychological ground of who we are as human beings. Such values as truth, beauty, and goodness are considered to be indispensable ground, foundational ground, and therefore called constant. You see, they are part of the human psyche, or rather foundational ground of the human psyche, and therefore universal in essence. If some of you have studied this a little bit more than an introductory level, or read something on a topic, you might have come across Plato's line. When we talk about these Platonic values, there was this Plato, Plato's line. At the top of the line, all the terms that stand for what is permanent. And at the lower level of that line, equivalent, or rather the opposite, to that term. In other words, spirit will have body, you know, something which is divine, which means you know, under it will have 
mortal. So this platonic line, this line of Plato, was a very simple example where the top of the line exemplifies who we are in essence. It's our divine essence. Granted. Yet the lower line is what we are dealing with, namely human condition. And according to Plato, it is the aspiration of evolved human being to live in accord with the top line, so as to transcend the lower strata, what here constitutes human condition. Please, I ask you to be attentive, because this is tremendously important. You will see that this has direct analogy with a lot of Oriental teachings. It has direct analogy here with the teachings of what is exemplified and presented through the sutras of Patanjali. It is the same psychological setup. At the base of the line, you have human condition. All that which is impermanent, misperception, changeable, unstable, flimsy, untrue, and above you have that what is permanent, immortal, divine, the only truth, and so forth. And the aspiration is to bring one's consciousness to that level where one continuously aspires to live by the mark of what this Plato's line exemplifies in terms of comparative analysis of human condition or human predicament versus who we are in essence. In a way, Plato's cave, another very well-known example which gave way to you know, films like Matrix and you know, The Dark City, all this is in, completely in, inseparable from Plato's cave is more of a, if you will, pictorial example of that Plato's line. When we live and accept this condition we call human as a given and the only way to live, we are bound by that cave. We are the prisoners of that condition which Plato illustrated through his idea of the cave. Plato's cave. So this, this is a Western perspective on the importance of the values. Yet the values here, you see, already being recognized by Plato as inherent to human psyche. In other words, according to Plato again, all these ideas of genetic inheritance upbringing and the list goes on is always secondary because it belongs to that what is changeable and untrue whereas the true lays at the top and that's who we are and the difference here one and the only difference what makes and saves the day it's in the act of what we aspire to in other words, if we don't even aspire to that what is our essence, how on earth can that what we are not aspired to be actualized? Yes, of course, Plato found a lot of critics and people who were considering this to be impossible ideal and therefore, <laughs> very often, it's not just that with Plato, we have the beginning of the materialistic versus idealistic philosophy. Here is a double pun. It's idealistic because it's speaking of the unreachable ideals, not just idealistic in terms of the root idea. Idea here stands for, of course, will of God, will of the divine. 
the tantric will, knowledge and action, which we will leave to later on in the course, but just to throw it here, so that for your further pondering on and of the importance of what aspiring to place here when we speak about these platonic values, platonic constants. Now, the same ideas we can find, the same similar view is being upheld by all major schools of Buddhism, without exception. Already from the start, all Buddhist traditions view human being from in that light, that our essence, our nature, is goodness itself. Our nature is already, has that, because it's embedded in goodness as a given condition. Very important adjustment to our understanding. In other words, we need to look and give current culture a critical analysis without being afraid to scrutinize why it has become a norm to live outside this, what is our condition. Instead, we've been told to accept that we, in fact, are meager individuals reveling in our own filth. Therefore, it's a rat race and strongest survive, survival of the fittest, and all that what essentially gives the rightful blueprint to the culture we find ourselves in at a global level. The collective culture, the current capitalistic culture that we live in, capitalism has that trade, unmistakable trade here, that everything is for the sake of being used by me. Why? Because the sun is shining and I can do it. Why? Because many, many isms came from the, since the time of Plato. Some of these isms created cozy, comfortable philosophies for this, for this adharmic living to become a norm. And the purpose of this course is to dismantle the very premises of what current system of value we all partake and share when it comes to our spiritual work, because as it will become apparent, there is no way to do existential work on oneself outside of the domain of what collective consciousness represents and imposes upon each and every one of us. Please ponder on this. Please contemplate on this. Bring this into a focal point of your awareness, why that is, how improper, if you will, philosophical doctrine, how philosophy, one way or the other, rules the world. I mean, for everyone who studies philosophy, it is nothing new about it. Everyone who studies philosophy knows that there is no such thing as just happy-go-lucky, riding my bike, you know, flying my kite, doing my business. Nobody lives here outside of ideology. There's no such thing as simply living here by just, you know, minding my business. We all part and parcel, you know. I don't need to remind you the words from the Pink Floyd or this or that, the era gone by where all this rock and roll was sh supposed to shake the very core foundations of the culture so we no longer accept everything and take everything at its face value. So before one contemplates self-realization, one first needs to break out of the wall. One needs to cease to become a brick in that wall. But more about it later, so that we build gradually and proceed steadily.